Our next speaker is Dr. Susada Chitachak from the University of San Francisco. Susada is surely the product of very unusual circumstances, although way too familiar for the, to the Lao diaspora. But she never let the circumstances of her upbringing deter her grit and determination. And as you will see, she has obtained master's degree in education and a doctorate a degree in mathematics education. Today, she is committed to preparing and inspiring math students all around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Susada Chitachak. Lao students, especially Lao women, have what it takes to be successful in mathematics and in higher education. What if I told you I had a formula for success for Lao students? What if I told you the formula has nothing to do with computing with numbers? When I was younger, I dreamed of becoming a talk show host like my idol, Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> Oprah built an empire based on her ability to reach a massive audience. Her lessons, her messages, entertain, uplift, and inform people. In a way, as a mathematics educator, I'm the host of my classroom, where students are my audience, and the lesson is never just a number. The empirical evidence reveals that all students, despite their English language proficiency, socioeconomic background, or their mathematics ratings, can learn mathematics, provided high expectations, strong support, and accommodating of differences. Today, I will apply the same formula that helped my students become successful in mathematics, as well as myself, to a formula for success for Lao students. High expectations. Speak these words. Higher education is for Lao women. Mathematics is for Lao women. You see, I heard these words spoken to me early and often, and I began to believe them. Strong support. For me, I was actively seeking out women role models women mathematicians, women leaders, women pioneers. Accommodating of differences. See, when we understand the science behind how people learn, we approach education more informed. We explore ways to engage students using storytelling and real life situation, hands-on experiences that include manipulatives, pictures that inspire problem solving. And we create classrooms that encourage communication through written and verbal forms, right? In my dissertation study, I looked at seven English language learner students, ranging anywhere between the 14th percentile reading level to the 87th percentile reading level. Students with reading levels between 0 and 33% were categorized as low English proficient. Students with uh, reading levels between above 33% uh, to 66% were categorized as medium English proficient. And then students with anywhere above 66 percentile in the reading levels were categorized as high English proficient. In my research with English language learner students, I argued that when teachers select rich problems and allow students to explain their mathematical processes to their peers and th to each other, they're more likely to engage in advanced level mathematics. I also argue that when, um, I also argue that when uh, students are able to work in a heterogeneous or a mixed ability group, so, so don't track students low, medium, high, they're more likely to be able to answer more advanced uh, mathematics questions with conceptual understanding. And conceptual understanding I defined in my study as being able to explain a situation or a solution using more than one representation, right? So from the study, I'm going to show an example from the study, is students got to do a problem that looks something like this. So a problem that looks something like this. Students were asked to first individually reflect on this problem. So I want everyone in the audience to actually participate. Please take a look at this problem. Right? Don't worry, I won't call on anyone. <laughs> All right? So you're going to try to solve this problem. What does the sixth figure look like? And what does the tenth figure look like? 
how many total squares will be in each figure. Right? Students were asked to think about how to solve this problem using two different representations. And re representations include table of values, equations, diagrams, written or verbal explanations. Right? In a given 50 minute period, students were then asked to, after they reflect, to get into groups and discuss what it is, the ideas that they came up with. Right? Then they were actually asked to solve the problem right? on a piece of poster paper because the classroom was structured so that the teacher would walk around and monitor and select students who had teams that had the least correct problem to present first, and then the students who had the most correct problem present last. Right? And then this happened for a period of 10 interventions or two months. Students would present from the least correct to the most correct. And then as they were presenting, the teacher and the researcher, which is myself, asked students to reflect on the following questions. So as you listen to your peers present, what similarities do you notice? What is different? And would you change your process and your solution? The following is a sample of student work from the study. Right? Team one had three low English proficient student, and team two had one, uh, sorry, team one had three low English proficient student and one medium English proficient student. As you can see, I'd like you to notice the sophistication in which students use to solve the problem. They use diagrams as well as numerical expressions to explain how many total squares will be in the figure six and figure 10. <coughs> Now, if you look very closely in the bottom right-hand corner, you'll notice that this team not only completed the task, but also answered the challenge question, which was, what, find the 100th figure. How many total squares will be in the 100th figure? Pretty neat, right? right? This next uh, example is from another team of students, where there were two medium English proficient students and one high English proficient student. I'd like you to notice some of the similarities between the strategies. The students tried to use diagrams and numerical expressions, but they had failed to complete the task with the same given amount of time. So what I'd like to point out between these two examples are, notice that even though this team had more students who had higher English proficiency, they could not complete the task. Okay? So keep that in mind. Okay? The next slide I'd like to show you is a, a sample of uh, three different teams. These are the three different strategies that students in that class period came up with. Notice they use tables, diagrams, numeric expression. Right? And remember earlier I told you these students had a 14th percentile reading level to 87th percentile reading level. And they were exposed to these advanced type mathematics problems. Okay? Now, what I found from the study was that students who participated in these rich environments where the teacher carefully selected the rich mathematics problem as well as provide opportunities for students to discuss in mixed ability teams and present. Right? This is what I found. Three key things from this study that lasted two months or ten interventions. First, English language learner students are more likely to answer a question conceptually using two or more representations when they're asked to do so and when they're given an opportunity to work with peers in mixed ability teams. Right? Second, Students actually filled in gaps in their knowledge after listening to their peers present. Right? So they not only, this, this is a team that could not complete the task in the, the same amount of time, but now they were able to not just complete the task, but a more advanced task that's similar individually. So from not being able to complete it as a team to being able to complete it individually. <laughs> and third, the most important finding, at least my favorite finding of my study was that Students English language proficiency was not an indicator of their ability to engage in higher level mathematics. Right? So there's no correlation between reading level and English language proficiency and ability to do mathematics. So that sounds really promising for Lao students, yeah? Right? So, so, so what? Why, do, why does the study matter? Why does the study on mathematics education from the United States of America with English language learners how does it appeal to Lao students? Why should they care, right? Earlier, I had mentioned that mathematics and life mirror, right? There's grit involved, 
and grit is persevering despite the obstacles. And mathematics, at least for 9 out of 10 people that I meet, is about overcoming obstacles or problem solving, as I would say, right? So I'm really excited to share that, my own personal story with you about mathematics and grit, right? So most people are actually surprised to learn that I have Lao parents. I was born to Lao parents, and I was born in a Thai refugee camp. My mother has a grade school education, and my father has a technical degree. My mother actually dropped out of grade school um, after being shamed for going to school by her mother, my grandmother, who believed that girls don't go to school. Girls work inside the home. So it was a combination of listening to uh, stories from my mother about the low expectations from my mother, my grandmother, I apologize, to observing my parents' quiet struggle working multiple jobs during odd hours of the night that I applied the three formulas that I use for my mathematics education study is high expectations. Set high expectations, allow students. Right? Do not be easily discouraged because failure is part of success. And that being excellent is not looking at your work and saying, good enough. Being excellent is always looking at your work and asking, how can I improve? That's one. Two, strong support. I sought out women professionals that I wanted to become, women pioneers and women leaders. Third, accommodating for differences. I understood that my background was not a deficit, that it actually was an asset. Right? I also understood that standardized exams that labeled me as average actually only predicted my family's socioeconomic background. And that the rejection from my first choice university as an undergraduate should not and did not delay my dreams. I was fortunate to have teachers who looked at my refugee background and my language barriers, not as deficits, but they, they searched to find that I had other strengths. They noticed that I had grit. I had to work really hard to persevere through my English as a second language learning courses. I also had to overcome other obstacles that my native-born peers did not have to. In a way, mathematics gave me self-esteem when I was most vulnerable. And I remember feeling empowered. And I set out to do the same for students across the globe. To date, I've traveled to over 25 countries on six continents to spread the good news of what mathematics and education has done for me. It took me from a poverty setting to a global stage. And so to close, what I would like to challenge all of you is to really reflect on the following question. In what ways do you entertain, uplift, and inform Lao students, especially Lao women, to pursue higher education? You see, I may be a mathematics educator on paper, but the lesson is never just a number. High expectations, strong support, and accommodating of differences are what it takes. Grit is what it takes. Thank you. Thank you, Susana. Please, another round of applause, please. Thank you, Susada, for this exceptional talk. She's right. Grit and determination are sometimes our last resort in order to surmount even the biggest of challenges. And we appreciate her for coming to us and share her journey in life.